Thank you for coming out in this weather. Much appreciated. We were just waiting for some folks to come from the lobby. I'm Kathy Lucero. I'm vice president of the Historical Society. And uh, tonight, um, I'm very happy to um, have this wonderful program on Howard Johnson's uh, Hojo's, as we all know it. Um, but tonight, before we start, I do like to uh, do a little housekeeping, if we could. We have some wonderful things coming up. Um, the first thing that's coming up is this Saturday. You, those who are on our mailing list will get a uh, flyer in the mail on our vintage paper coned wreaths. We have one up here uh, this, morning, this, this evening, and uh, we, the women of Woman, or the women of the historical society, have made these from vintage books that would have been destroyed. And uh, we've made probably about 30 wreaths, and they, they're everything from, you know, old Norman Rockwell. Uh, 1896 um, math books. There's children's books for you know dinosaurs and maps. They're very, they're really quite beautiful. And that will be Saturday at the Burdett Mansion from 10 to 3. And they are an exhibit, but they are also to be sold. They're uh, going to the funds will go to our partners in um, education program. And um, we hope that you would come and see them and uh, hopefully buy something for Christmas or for yourself or whatever. Then we also have um, coming up. December uh, 14th, the Merry Minstrels will do a Christmas uh, musical performance at Spence Farm. Usually it is at the Burdette, but uh, it's a little bigger if we could do it at Spence Farm. So that be you'll have the announcement on that. And then uh, in December, December 15th, we have the big swing band, 21-piece band, coming back. We had them in 2011. And for those uh, who may know John Stevens, he actually sang at Maya Menino's funeral. Uh, just recently, and he has a wonderful swing band, and uh, that will be the, those. You do require tickets; it's ten dollars each, and members on the membership list will get first priority for tickets. And uh, last time that they were here, we sold out. We had 750 people here; it was wonderful. They do a great, great show. Um, tonight, um, I would like to welcome Joe Crowley back. He's sitting in the corner back there. We're very happy to have Joe back. He'll be back to his old form soon. Uh, tonight, we have, uh, after the um, presentation by Anthony, we are serving ice cream. We have we can, Howard Johnson's. We can't get Howard Johnson's ice cream, but we have Mr. Charlie's ice cream, and we have, uh, for those, we have to make their own little kind of creamsicle. It's uh, orange sherbet and vanilla and the wafers that you used to get with the uh, Howard Johnson's ice cream. Am I right, Anthony? So I hope you stay just for a little bit and uh, have some ice cream with us, even though it's like 40 degrees outside. We can think it's summer. Uh, I'd like to introduce, if I could, uh, Anthony Samako, our speaker for this evening. Anthony is from Boston. He has written 68 books. And uh, they are on eBay. They're at Barnes & Noble, such as the book that he has here tonight on Howard Johnson's. And uh, one of his most popular ones that is recent is Baker Chocolate and uh, also Lost Boston, which I'm sure he'll say a few words about. I just wanted to show you one thing. He didn't know we, would di we did this, but this is one of our vintage wreaths from uh, an old cookbook of Fanny Farmer from 1947 that was going to be destroyed. And the page that we decorated it with to keep it in the period is Baker Chocolate. So maybe he'll buy this from me. I don't know. But uh, this is what we're doing with the wreaths. And it's you know pieces like that to bring back memories for people. And uh, we're hoping that uh, you'll all, as I say, come out. But Baker Chocolate was a tie with Anthony. And uh, I'm sure he'll mention that. Anthony, can please come up. If I could have the lights, that'd be great. How many people here remember Howard Johnson? Well, I think in a lot of ways, it is something of a 20th century phenomena. When it was opened in 1925 in Wollaston, which is a neighborhood of Quincy, Massachusetts, this man, Howard Deering Johnson, parlayed with hard work, drive, and business acumen into one of the most successful roadside restaurants in the United States. It went from basically what was a company in debt. When he started in 1925, this was a man who had taken a $300 loan from his widowed mother and a $2,000 loan from Dr. George Dalton, who was an internist at Quincy City Hospital, to begin in a such a way with a corner store 
But by the time he died in 1972, this man was worth over $800 million. Howard Johnson was born in Dorchester, but he would eventually be raised in Quincy. And throughout that period, it was an important aspect in his life to not only support his family, but also in some ways, look at the company as something that he could pass on. And seen here with his company, he branded it with Simple Simon and the Pieman. This was actually done in 1935 by John Alcott. He was a graphic designer from Islington, which is a part of Westwood, Massachusetts. And we realized that Howard Johnson's trademark was something that would be used not just on cups and saucers, as well as glasses, placemats, napkins, even swizzle sticks. But the whole idea was that this was something that branded the company with its logo, but it was also John Alcott who created the color scheme. Maybe you remember Howard Johnson restaurants. They had orange roofs and turquoise blue shutters. And that was something that was not only readily identifiable on the road, but once you saw this trademark, you knew that there was delicious food and ice cream available almost 18 hours a day. But Howard Johnson also solidified the base. He was president from 1925 until 1959, and he handed over the company to his son, Howard Brennan Johnson, in 1959. He would continue it until 1979 when it was sold to Imperial Group. Imperial Group was a British conglomerate, and they would actually pay only $135 million, which was quite a little less than it was worth in 1959. But the whole concept was that these two men, for almost 70 years, saw to it that this was one of the most profitable as well as delicious business enterprises in the country. But when we think of Howard Johnson, we have to really begin at the very aspect of 1925. And seen here in a postcard of about 1930, Howard Johnson purchased a small drugstore seen on the right-hand side on Beale Street in Wollaston. Wollaston was a part of Quincy, and we saw Quincy actually burgeoning by the period of the early 20th century. It had become a city in 1888, and it went basically from close to 40,000 people to over 200,000 by 1930. And the concept was many of these people chose Quincy because of its accessibility to the city. And just to the left of his store was the granite branch of the Old Colony Railroad. This was the Wollaston Depot. We saw people commuting to Boston for business purposes during the day and in the evening for pleasure, whether it was for movies or plays or musicals. But the whole idea was that Howard Johnson opened this corner store where he served not just three forms of ice cream, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. But he also actually sold newspapers, magazines, cigars, and cigarettes to the commuters going to Boston. The idea was in 1925, he had a soda fountain. And that soda fountain was something that actually provided not just delicious ice cream, but it would be worked by the man on the left-hand side, a man by the name of Everett Porter. Porter had worked with Howard Johnson for over a year trying to perfect the ice cream that they served, but they were never successful. Maybe you've tried ice cream and sometimes it was slivers of little bits of ice. It wasn't quite as creamy or rich as one might have hoped. Well, he and Everett Porter worked in unison, but by the period of 1926, they realized that they weren't successful they decided to actually contact a professional, and that was a man by the name of William Halbauer. Halbauer was a German immigrant who lived in Nahant, Massachusetts, and he was said to have made the best ice cream in the Boston area. His ice cream was rich, creamy, delicious, and it was something in a lot of ways that was smoother than the ice cream that Howard Johnson was making. Well, Halbauer said, yes, he could help him, but he would only sell the recipe for $300. Well, $300 doesn't sound like an awful lot of money, but in 1925, it was a considerable sum. Hal Bauer sat down with not only Johnson, but Everett Porter, and they actually discussed the making of ice cream, and Hal Bauer said, all you need to do is double your butterfat. And by doubling the butterfat, it became a creamy, rich confection. Well, Howard Johnson said, for $300, we should have known that. 
but he said if he doubles his butterfat, and his ice cream is so delicious, instead of the 11% that one would have increased it, I'll increase it by 13% to 21% butterfat count. And at that point, Howard Johnson began to make what was basically a premium ice cream with 28 flavors, all natural ingredients, with a flavor for almost every palate. Well, in a lot of ways, the ice cream was so successful that within the year, he actually rented a small stand at Wollaston Beach Boulevard. And seen here, the building itself, which had a residence above, only cost $300 for the summer. But there, Howard Johnson began to serve his 28 flavors of ice cream, in addition to fried clams, grilled frankfurters, and cool drinks. His ice cream was so popular that in one Saturday during the summer of 1926, he sold 14,000 ice cream cones at a nickel a cone. And people began to realize it wasn't just delicious, but it was twice the size of what every other ice cream parlor was serving. The next year, he would open new stands at Nantasket Beach in Hull and Revere Beach in Revere. And during that period, he was actually doing quite well. Howard Johnson, though, by 1929 realized that his ice cream was not just a success, but his little corner store had done quite well. He decided to open a restaurant, and he wanted it to be a New England-style restaurant and in Quincy, where he lived. And seen here in a postcard, this is Quincy Square in 1950. This was the area on the left-hand side, the Church of the Presidents, where the Adamses actually worshipped. And on the right-hand side was Quincy City Hall. But in the distance was the Granite Trust Building. This was Quincy's high rise. It was actually a bank that had been founded in 1832, and it actually was something in a lot of ways that people looked at as not only the tallest building south of Boston, but one of the most profitable concerns on the south shore of Massachusetts. And during 1929, he would meet with the president of the bank, a man by the name of Theophilus King, who would actually talk with Johnson for less than a half an hour. But at the end of that half hour, not only gave him a line of credit to the tune of $50,000, but the area just to the left of the entrance of the bank. This bank, which was 11 stories in height, was used as a financial institution. But the ground floor was used for rental property to help offset the maintenance of the building. Howard Johnson's restaurant, with its wonderful sign that says, Howard Johnson, would open in the summer of 1929. And there, he began to serve such wonderful things as baked macaroni and cheese, chicken pot pie, beef pot pie, shrimp curry, and of course, 28 flavors of ice cream. He hired a woman by the name of Helen Church, who was a trained dietitian, to work with him. She was living in Boston while her husband attended the Harvard Medical School. And she herself would work with Johnson to make not only nutritious, but attractive plates that could be served for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. As a trained nutritionist, I wonder what she really thought of a double butterfat ice cream count. But in that instance, we began to realize that Howard Johnson was getting a following. People came not only for businessmen's lunches, but in the evening, families. Well, he got his great claim to fame because of the theater on the right-hand side. You can see the marquee projecting. And that was the Quincy Theater. And in the summer of 1929, Eugene O'Neill's play, Strange Interlude, was being performed by the Theater Guild in New York City. And it was thought that it would eventually come to Boston. Well, it had been great success in New York. But people began to actually hear things about the play. It was a little bit immoral. It dealt with adultery. Well, Malcolm Nichols, who was the mayor of Boston, went to New York to actually see the play. And when he returned to Boston, the first thing he did was to contact the New England Watch and Ward Society. He said, that damn play is immoral and it will not be performed in my city. Well, the Theater Guild had already sold 40,000 advance tickets, and they weren't about to refund the money. And because they were banned in Boston, they began to contact cities and towns around the metropolitan Boston area. And they were refused one after the other. The only city that said yes was Quincy. So I guess they were a little less moral than anyone else. But in that instance, Eugene O'Neill's play opened on September 1st of 1929. 
And because the play was five and a half hours in length, it didn't have an admit, uh, intermission, it actually had a dinner break. And the only place to go for dinner was Howard Johnson's restaurant. He raised the price for a meal from 50 cents to a dollar a plate immediately. And for eight weeks, he raked in the money. When it closed the third week of October in 1929, he said, well, I look forward to a wonderful winter. The unfortunate thing that Friday was Black Friday and the Great Depression occurred. Howard Johnson's restaurant, though it had delicious food and magnificent 28 flavors of ice cream, really couldn't compete because no one had the money to dine out. And during the period of the late 1929 and early 1930, he was able to sustain the restaurant. And you would see in some ways that this building itself would continue. The Granite Trust did not fail. But his little restaurant itself began to eke out a small income for him, as well as his wife, his widowed mother, and his three unmarried sisters. And we began to realize during that period that Howard Johnson was at wit's end. He had a $50,000 line of credit that he had taken from the bank. He had to pay that with interest, but it was all that he basically could bring in to support his family. Well, in 1933, he came up with a brilliant idea. He would franchise his restaurant. Everyone loved it. They said that the food was good. They said the ice cream was delicious. And he had a good friend by the name of Reginald Heber Sprague. Sprague lived in Wollaston, but his family had property in Orleans on Cape Cod. And Sprague and he actually met for a drink and they began to discuss financial problems as most people did during the Depression. And Howard Johnson broached the subject that Sprague's family owned a piece of property at the junction of Route 28 and 6A in Orleans. And if you're coming in from Eastham, you couldn't miss it. Today, it's the site of the Christmas tree shop. It really is a great location. But Sprague himself would actually take on the aspect of a franchise. If you purchased a franchise from Howard Johnson, and at this time it was $4,000, you not only opened a restaurant, but you also had to buy all of the food and ice cream from Howard Johnson, who provided it through a commissary. Well, in May of 1935, the first restaurant franchise in the Howard Johnson chain would open in Orleans. And seen here, the building still stands adjacent to the Christmas tree shop, which happened to be the Sprague Mansion. But in this way, they began to serve for nine months out of the year the delicious ice cream and the foods that Howard Johnson's restaurant in Quincy had now become very famous for. Well, Sprague was able to pay off his debt within two years of $17,000 to build this and to take out loans for ongoing expenses. But within a short period of time, new restaurants would open in Dorchester, and this was actually on the old Colony Parkway. Today we call it Morrissey Boulevard, followed by one in Dedham, Massachusetts, and then later in Cambridge, Massachusetts. By 1940, there were 125 restaurants throughout New England, and we began to realize that each of these orange roof restaurants with a 20-foot tall marquee, usually with illuminated neon lights, could not only be seen during the day because of the brilliance of the color, but also in the evening as it was illuminated as one drove by. In a lot of ways, people looked at Howard Johnson and realized that its traditional New England decor, seen here with wide paneling of naughty pine, was something that wasn't just attractive, but even the furniture was actually something that was comfortable to sit on. Howard Johnson's restaurants, these New England-styled restaurants with delicious food, were an important feature. And whether you saw the orange roof or the marquee, it was all thanks to John Eagles Alcott, that graphic designer that I mentioned. And seen here about 1940, this was a man who had hundreds of different graphic designs. But the idea was, in some ways, that Howard Johnson's was his largest customer base. Howard Johnson and he would work right through to 1971 when Alcott died and created, as I said earlier, things such as not only placemats and napkins and swizzle sticks, 
but also eventually saw the trademark becoming a black and white silhouette of Simple Simon and the Drooling Dog. And this was something that was not only readily identifiable as a brand of this 20th century business, but it was something that the people knew when they saw they would actually be able to have delicious food, good ice cream, and sensible prices. Well, Howard Johnson's, in a lot of ways, has always been known for its 28 flavors. And seen here in a photograph of about 1940, the young man on the left actually holds four sugar cones as he scoops ice cream from the freezer. But above, it says 28 flavors, and it goes the gamut from apple all the way to vanilla. Well, the flavors might change regionally. New England might have different flavors than Miami Beach or even the West Coast. But the whole idea was that ice cream at a premium aspect, meaning double butterfat count, as well as a large serving at a nickel a plate, was something in some ways that people actually came back for more. And seen here, this wonderful close-up of one of Alcott's graphic designs that was used in nationwide magazines shows a man behind the counter awaiting the order of these three young children as they stare at the board behind him. And they see the ga gamut, banana, again, all the way to vanilla. Children were an important feature, and in many ways, Howard Johnson even showed many of his own children seen here in these wonderful advertisements. This was actually from a billboard, and in the center was Howard Johnson's daughter, Dorothy, and on the right, his son, Howard Brennan Johnson, on the left is his nephew, Timmy. But these children would smile, and above would say, we love our daddy's ice cream, and so too won't you. Well, the young boy on the left has an ice cream sundae, Dorothy has an ice cream float, and Howard has an ice cream cone. I'd smile if somebody offered me ice cream too. But that smile translated into sales. And we saw this as something that traveling public would actually see, and the children, would actually appear in these advertisements from the time they were toddlers right through to their college years when they finally told their father they weren't going to do it anymore. But the children were an important feature and seen here in 1938, they're seated on either side of their father. This is his home in Quincy, Massachusetts. It was on Forbes Hill, a Summit Avenue, a beautiful house. He's holding a small booklet that has the name The History of Howard Johnson's. Now, the company was only 13 years old at this time, and the history was all of two and a half pages long. The other 13 pages were the locations of restaurants, not only in New England, but in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Because by this time, Howard Johnson was getting the concession to open restaurants on the major turnpike roads. Eventually, they'd open not only on the Massachusetts Turnpike, but the Ohio Turnpike, the New Jersey Turnpike, and the Pennsylvania Turnpike. But seen here, it was an important feature because Howard Johnson, this man who had started off in debt in 1925, by 1938 was making a million dollars a year. In that instance, he decided to move from Quincy to the next town, which was Milton, and he bought this house, which was on Brush Hill Road. And this house had been designed by Peabody and Stearns, a very well-known architectural firm. It was small. It was only eight suite bedrooms. It was on 14 acres of land, four-car garage, greenhouse, tennis courts, and it only cost $11,000. But of course, in 1939, that was a tremendous sum of money. It had been built by Norwood Penrose Hallowell, who was a financier who lived in Boston's Back Bay, who used this as a weekend house. It wasn't a summer house. But he had actually moved to Manhattan, and he decided that this house had to be sold. Well, Howard Johnson did buy it, but not really to live here. He bought it to entertain his potential customers the people who would buy the franchises. And on the back lawn, what he would do was to set up an enormous marquee, and you can see the tent in the distance, where he would actually entertain upwards of 400 people, both men and women, who were interested in buying a franchise. Now, seen in the center, Howard Johnson was a very good businessman. This was a man who would invite these people who had $4,000 to invest 
in Howard Johnson's restaurant franchise. Now, Howard Johnson owned one-third of them outright. The other two-thirds were actually franchises that would be owned by a person who actually bought the franchise and actually bought all of the ice cream and food from Howard Johnson's commissaries. It was a little bit of an expense because one had to put up enough money to build the restaurant and then, of course, to staff it. But in this instance, these two men on either side were indicative of the people that would come. On the left was a man named George Cotter. He lived in Connecticut, and eventually he bought two restaurant franchises that were still running as late as 1971. And the man on the right holding his hands in front of him was a man named George Lawson. He did buy a Howard Johnson franchise, but he later sold it because he opened his own restaurant. You might remember it. It was called the Pillar House, which was at Route 128. Well, Lawson was typical of the people that would look at Howard Johnson and realize that this was a man with an eighth-grade education who was able not only to sustain a multi-million dollar company, but to get people to want to invest with the purchase of a franchise. And in that way, these marquees would be set up with an open bar in each corner of the tent where they'd only serve grilled frankfurts. These weren't hot dogs. These were all beef frankfurts grilled in creamery butter and served in a toasted bun. And, of course, you began to realize that Howard Johnson was someone who was a great marketeer. And in that way, many people began to realize that he was someone to reckon with. Now, surprisingly, in 1939, Fortune magazine did an 18-page article that was entitled, Who is Howard Johnson's? Well, by 1939, these restaurants had sprung up as if by magic, not just in New England, but New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and even Florida. Howard Johnson was someone that many people couldn't understand how he could be so successful. He didn't attend the Harvard Business School. But in this way, one of the advertisements in Fortune magazine said, The boss, it's my favorite. And a woman holds a chocolate ice cream cone. It looks delicious. But this was not any chocolate ice cream. This was ice cream that was made with real Belgian chocolate. It was double butterfat. And it was something that wasn't just sumptuous, but it was creamy, rich, and delicious. And, of course, Fortune magazine began to realize that this man was someone who had what was something called Johnson's Book. And this photograph of a group of chefs at one of Howard Johnson's restaurants shows them, and it says that they cook by Johnson's Book. Well, Johnson called it his Bible, but today we would call it an employee manual. And that employee manual actually outlined every single person's job, whether you were the hostess, the waiter, the waitress, the busboy or the bus girl, or even the cook. And the idea was that your job had to be done to the best of your ability because it impinged on everyone else in the operation. And Howard Johnson looked at these future franchisees as people that would actually be trained. They'd have to take a course for two months, 40 hours a week, with Howard Johnson to learn how to do the operation. Once they had actually had their money accepted and they signed an official contract, they'd meet with Howard Johnson. And these courses would go the gamut. But one of them was something that was actually called portion control. Portion control was something that was important. This man would actually show these two young men, one of whom holds a luncheon tray, the other holds a dinner tray, how to actually make it attractive, but also cost-effective. Now, the thing was, a few extra French fries, an extra scoop of tapioca pudding, it doesn't sound like an awful lot, but if you do it consistently every single day, by the end of the month, it cuts into your profits. And this man with the portion control tried to show people how to make an attractive plate, but also not overfill it with food. And one of the things that Howard Johnson actually did was he had a parsley farm, and every plate had a huge piece of parsley on it. And it took up not only quite a bit of the plate, but it looked quite attractive. And in that way, we began to realize that Howard Johnson's restaurants were not just known, but they were patronized by people of all walks of life. Seen here, this was in Rigo Park, New York, 
which is a neighborhood of Jamaica, part of Manhattan. The building itself was the largest restaurant in the country at that time. It seated 1,100 people at any given time. Obviously, the largest orange roof in the world as well. But this was something that was a restaurant franchise. Howard Johnson wanted to open this because it was on the road leading to the New York World's Fair. And if you look on the upper left-hand side, you can see the Paris Fair, which was part of the World's Fair. Well, New York wanted to open the World's Fair to actually offset the economy. It was thought that if they could actually attract tourism, it might be something that would help New York. Well, by 1939, when this restaurant was built, whether you were going to the fair on foot, by bicycle, by horse, or even by automobile or bus, you had to pass by this restaurant. Howard Johnson went in with a woman by the name of Lydia Pinkham Gove. Lydia Gove was a very wealthy woman, and she put up $300,000 at the height of the Depression to actually have one half of the restaurant franchise. Well, she had the money because she was the treasurer of a company that her grandmother, Lydia Pinkham, had founded in Salem, Massachusetts. Maybe you know the name Lydia Pinkham. She created a medicine. And in the 19th century, this medicine was something that was purported to cure every female ailment. And because it was 99% alcohol and a few herbs and spices, it actually could have cured any male ailment as well. Well, in that period, it survived FDA scrutiny. And in 1935, this was a woman who purchased her first restaurant franchise in Jamaica on Long Island in New York. But by 1939, putting up $300,000, she and Howard Johnson owned it half equally. And what she did in some ways was to help him create one of the finest restaurants in the country. On opening night, they actually invited their nearest and dearest. And you see Howard Johnson in white tie and tails in the middle. She's just to the left with the dark earring. They invited 800 people, not only family but friends, and, of course, there were bars in every corner of the restaurant. And this was a place that was not only decorated with Murano glass chandeliers from Venice, ingrain carpeting, banquets that were upholstered in burgundy velvet, but also walls that were painted by the best muralists of the day. They didn't skimp. But the whole idea was when this party sat down to dinner, they didn't have a dinner that was served to them. They had to order from the menu. Most of these people had never been to a Howard Johnson's, and they didn't realize that, you know, they served macaroni and cheese and pot pies and chicken curry, but they also served steaks and chops as well as even lobster tails. And by word of mouth, Howard Johnson's restaurants became not only the place to go, but they were sensibly priced. And in a lot of ways, we began to realize that this one restaurant, when it opened, was something that had foot traffic. But he and Lydia Pinkham Gove actually decided to mint this gold coin. On the obverse, it says the New York World's Fair in 1939. And on the obverse was simple Simon and the Pieman. It had no monetary value whatsoever. But if you were passing by this restaurant and you brought this coin with you, 10% was taken off your meal. So whether you were having a cup of coffee and a piece of pie or a full meal, 10% was taken off. This coin was said in two years to have a 12 million turnover. So you can imagine in that two-year period that Howard Johnson served a minimum of 12 million people, maybe even more. And during that period, this restaurant with the large orange roof that could be seen from a mile away during the day had a 25-foot-tall marquee that was illuminated with colored neon lights. At the very top, Simple Simon and the Pieman. But below it says Howard Johnson's 28 flavors of ice cream. And it also showed what they served. They had a grill, a cocktail lounge, special luncheons, steaks, chops, chicken, fried clams, and special frankfurts. There was something for every palate. But Howard Johnson, during this period of time, began to realize that when he opened these restaurants with the people that had purchased the franchise, 
What he was trying to do was to induce them to purchase a piece of property on a major automobile road. Because the ascendancy of the automobile meant that the traveling public, be it a businessman during the day or a family out for a drive on the weekend, would pass by the restaurant. And here at Wellington Circle in Medford, Massachusetts, this would actually be a 1937 restaurant when it was opened. In the foreground, the road led towards Everett and Revere. On the right, it led through Medford to Stoneham. On the left, through Somerville, Charlestown to Boston, and in the distance through Medford to Somerville. If you were traveling, you actually had to pass the restaurant. And the whole idea was that by 1940, this prototype restaurant, which was in Canton, Massachusetts, on the Milton Line, would actually show an orange tile roof, a cupola, along with an illuminated light, a weather vane of Simple Simon and the Pieman, and parking spaces for at least 70 automobiles. Howard Johnson realized that his restaurants were patronized by people now who were traveling by automobile. Granted, many people came on foot as well. But the idea was, with the ascendancy of the automobile, his restaurants were not just popular, but they began to bring the public in for more. And of course, what was it? But it was America's choice. And with the smiling waitress, this full-page color advertisement in nationwide magazines showed her holding a menu that said, delicious food. It wasn't just the traditional standbys, but there were even daily specials, a little less expensive. But it was an important feature to realize, with a ready smile and an engaging attitude, this was something that made people feel welcome. But it wasn't just menus for adults. As early as 1937, Howard Johnson created a children's menu. And this one, you can see Humpty Dumpty at the top, and of course, Simple Simon and the Pieman. When the child opened the menu, he or she could order something that was appealing to a child. But the surprising thing was, it wasn't just child size and portion, but it was child size and price, which mother and father and grandparents probably appreciated. Children were an important feature, and there was always a high chair at the ready. But during the period of the 1960s, some of the menus themselves were a little bit different. This was a baseball cap, and it said, Simple Simon, met a pieman, go into the fair. And when the child turned over the menu, on the reverse would actually be different things that he or she could order. Well, maybe they liked the Plymouth Rocky, which was sliced turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy, and peas, with ice cream for dessert, or Mr. Twist, which was spaghetti and a meatball with ice cream for dessert, or even the Super Sailor, fried clams, french fries, and ice cream for dessert. Once the child had placed his or her order, they could then take the hat, as you see on the lower right-hand side, and place it on their head and entertain their parents until they got their meal. But if they went for breakfast at Howard Johnson, they could become Mr. Pancake Face. And Mr. Pancake Face had the menu on the reverse, and the child actually having placed their order with the aid of twine or yarn could then put this on their face as a mask and possibly entertain their parents or torture those in the adjacent banquet. But the whole idea was children were an important feature, and if one felt that their children were welcome at Howard Johnson, they were more inclined to patronize it. And during that period, Howard Johnson, and this is a close-up of a much larger advertisement, actually saw his orange-roofed restaurant chain throughout the United States. And by the period of 1950, there were over 500 restaurants, all of which served the same menu all through Howard Johnson's commissaries. And in a lot of ways, you began to realize Howard Johnson, with his children, must have been a wonderful person. Sometimes when I did this book on Howard Johnson, I began to wonder what he was truly like. But I don't think there was much gray matter. Either you liked him or you disliked him. There was nothing in between. But seen here, his two children were his life. Surprisingly, Howard Johnson was married four times. His first wife that he married in 1921 sued him for desertion. Of course, working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, I suppose I'd feel deserted if my wife left as well. 
His second wife, who was the mother of Dorothy, the daughter, died in childbirth. The third wife, the mother of Howard, the son, sued him for cruelty in 1937, and they were divorced. And the fourth wife, he won in a fistfight. <laughs> she was the estranged wife of Mayor Bergen of Quincy, Massachusetts, and they actually would be boyfriend and girlfriend for 10 years before they finally married, and she outlived him. But his children were an important feature. They never lived with him. They always boarded at school. And we saw in some ways he provided everything for them. But in a lot of ways, he was a perfectionist. And seen here in a photograph of 1955, he would arrive at a commissary that had provided, in some ways, the food for the restaurants. And he would say, serve me a dozen pies. He would taste test the filling of every single pie, not only for consistency, but flavor. But he would also taste test the crust. Was it as flaky as it should be? And he would say, if it wasn't good enough for him, that it wasn't good enough for his customers. And he began to realize that this man, though he sat there with a, a wonderful uh, napkin around his neck, great job to have with a dozen pies in front of him, you began to realize in some ways that this was the way he ran his business. Well, in a lot of ways, these advertisements in the period of the 1950s and 60s were fantastic. They'd go the gamut from young children right through to families. And here it says that Howard Johnson's was a haven for the folks, but it was heaven for the kids. And you can see all of the children going to Howard Johnson's. But it wasn't just young children, it was even teenagers. And of course, teenagers can be one of the more difficult ages, if you haven't realized that. And here, they're around an automobile. And the boy on the left says, what a dish. And of course, he's thinking of an ice cream sundae. But the dish is seated in the automobile, and she says, you men are all alike. Last night, it was frankfurters and french fries. And of course, the young boy of the foreground is painting the 28 flavors of ice cream in the side of the automobile. Children love it. Teenagers love it. Even young married couples in 1950 love it. A bride says to her groom, can't you think of anything but 28 flavors? And the groom says, nothing except those frankfurters and fried clams, the hurry-up service and sensible prices. I guess young married couples were different 60 years ago. But a few years later, mother and father had a group of children and father, with his receding hairline, approaches Howard Johnson's in his automobile, and he says, 18 flavors, I mean 18, 28 flavors, 28 flavors, 28 flavors. That's all I ever hear. And the little boy in the background says, and don't forget the frankfurters and fried clams for those piggyback prices. It went the gamut. But now, by 1950, it wasn't just children, teenagers, young married couples or families going, even bumblebees descended upon Howard Johnson's, equipped with a spoon, not to pollinate flowers, but to taste test ice cream cones growing in the front yard. Each of these advertisements were done by John Alcott. He was someone as the graphic designer who oversaw all of the advertising for Howard Johnson's from 1935 until 1971. And we realized in some ways that these appearing in Liberty, Look, Life magazine were important features, but they began to show in some ways, whether one was in Woven, Massachusetts, or Portland, Oregon, one knew Howard Johnson's because it seemed like there was one within driving distance. Well, in a lot of ways, Howard Johnson also began to do things that made people feel special. One of the things that he tried to induce some of the franchises to do was to offer desserts on special days. And in this way, on Mother's Day in the 1950s, he would offer mothers a free dessert. Mother would arrive in her hat and pearls and corsage, and after meal would actually order whatever she wanted for dessert, which was complimentary. It doesn't sound like an awful lot, but it made someone feel special, and he did this for a variety of things one of which was during World War II, any person that arrived at Howard Johnson's in uniform was to be given a free meal. Again, not a tremendous expense, but it made someone feel that at least you were recognized 
for your commitment to the United States. And in that way, Howard Johnson's restaurant franchises would show their generosity as well as respect for the person. And people came back. In that instance, they called all appetites. And here with the restaurant in the very center, you see on the left-hand side, people did come by foot, by horseback, convertible, automobile, bicycle, as well as horse-drawn wagon. And people looked at this as something that was available from early in the morning until late at night. Howard Johnson served delicious food and delicious ice cream, but it was something that many people looked at as a special thing. Well, in the 1950s and early 1960s, some of the restaurant franchises began to offer birthday parties free of charge to 12-year-olds and younger. Now, the idea was about six weeks before the child's birthday, the parents or the grandparents would be induced to fill out a form with the child's name and address and birth date so that this invitation would be sent to them three weeks before their date. Well, you couldn't miss it. It was orange and blue, and it said, Howard Johnson's wishes you a happy birthday and invites you to a birthday dinner. Well, what 12-year-old would refuse but what 12-year-old could get to Howard Johnson's on their own? Well, mother and father went, most of the siblings, both sets of grandparents, and aunts and uncles. It was only Monday through Thursday, which were the slow nights, but it was said that this actually had a 65% ratio of return. When the child arrived, yes, they were given a free meal, whatever they wanted but they also had a birthday cake with candles, balloons, party hats, and lollipops. The child felt special, but the parents and grandparents realized in some ways it was a wonderful gesture, and the child enjoyed it. In a lot of ways, that was what Howard Johnson was. It was special. But in a lot of ways, on the back of every one of these tables was a little card, and it said to our patrons, We desire to maintain and, as far as possible, to improve on our high standard of food and service. The entire satisfaction of our patrons is of vital importance, and your opinion will be a helpful guide. Well, if you had a complaint and you filled this out and you told Howard Johnson's exactly why you were complaining, Howard Johnson would call you personally, and you would also get two vouchers for a free meal. And that was something that he realized that many people probably weren't quite aware of. He valued the customer's opinion, whether it was positive or negative. And in that way, many people began to realize that if Howard Johnson was listening to us, why not return? In a lot of ways, it was an important feature. And that wonderful magazine article at Fortune that I spoke of earlier would actually touch upon some of the things that they did. Maybe you remember the fried clams. Well, the fried clams, as it says here, were as sweet as a nut. But these weren't typical clams. These were from Ipswich. And they had a company by the Sovereign Clam Company, which was run by four brothers who had been born in Kalamata in Greece and come to the United States as young men who actually were clam diggers. They would actually dig the clams and then bring them to the clam shucking shack, where these women would actually shuck the clams. They would then fill the little tins with the clams themselves, where they would then be brought to George Soffron, the eldest of the brothers, who would fill them in one-gallon Howard Johnson clam tins. And the idea was that these clams, beginning in 1932, would actually have a 32-year contract with the Soffrons and Howard Johnsons. The Sovereigns were the sole purveyors of all clams to Howard Johnson's. They had no other clients. And during that period of time, they would actually produce not only wonderful full belly clams, but they'd also begin to actually make what was called tender sweet. Well, seen here, Sovereign brothers not only tinned them, but would actually deliver them throughout New England with these trailers. But the whole aspect of the clams meant that by 1951, there were just not enough clams to go around from Ipswich. People would actually go to Howard Johnson's, and they would actually go on nights that they said it was Clambury Night. And Clambury Night was $1.29, and it was a plate of fried clams, fresh French fries, 
homemade coleslaw, homemade tartar sauce, and rolls and butter. It was not only delicious, but with a cup of clam chowder, something that was just wonderful. But they also began in the 1950s to begin to produce what they called the tender sweet clam. Now, the tender sweet clam was different than the Ipswich clam. Ipswich River just produced so many clams. And they began to expand the harvesting of clams as far as Nova Scotia and Hilton Head, South Carolina. And during that period of time, the clams were much larger. They were called a hen clam. And the hen clam was cut into strips and dredged and fried. They were delicious, but they didn't have a belly. And what they were were basically the first clam strips to be served to the American public in 1951. And George Soffron is on the right-hand side selling the name Tender Sweet to Howard Johnson's for $10,000. Well, clams were a delicious thing on the item menu. But the idea was it wasn't just clams. They also did turkey. And turkey was something that would be freshly roasted on a daily basis. And this advertisement said, take a tip from Rudy Valley, how to succeed in carving a turkey without really trying. Number one, put the family in the car. Number two, head for the orange roof. And number three, order Howard Johnson's turkey special. And at $1.49, this was freshly carved turkey, real mashed potatoes, vegetable, cranberry sauce, rolls and butter. It was almost as good as if one made it at home. But the whole idea was this was something that was available on a daily basis. So whether it was clams or turkey, people began to realize that Howard Johnson's was a special place. Well, by the late 60s and early 70s, children's menus became a little bit different. You might remember earlier that they looked like a baseball hat or Mr. Pancake Face. But by the 1970s, they were now booklets. And they were booklets that might be on the history of the metric system, the history of the bicentennial of the United States, or maybe even the history of rocket science. But in the very center would be the menu, and the child could place his or her order for lunch or dinner. But during that period of time, they could then begin to read about the different things that Howard Johnson was talking about. But some of the things actually had little games on the interior, one of which was this. It says, try to print these numbered letters in the like-numbered squares below. So if number T is an 8, number Y is a 6, number I is a 5, if you carried them down and you did it correctly, he or she would spell the word quality. Of course, the child would be very happy, but the word quality was not missed by the parents or the grandparents. For what was Howard Johnson's if the food and ice cream was not quality? This was something that not only entertained the child while they awaited their meal, but it was also a learning experience. But on the back of every one of these little booklets was another game called the ice cream game. And the ice cream game was something that had 28 flavors with a little box. And it says, check the box as you try each flavor. Well, if you had every box checked, you got a free ice cream cone. So could you imagine a child during the months of June, July, and August wanting to play the ice cream game three times a day? But the whole idea was ask mom and dad to stop at a Howard Johnson's. Well, by 1959, the founder, Howard Deering Johnson, stepped down as president. He had parlayed this company into a nationwide concern that was worth close to $750 million. He would eventually become chairman of the board and treasurer of the corporation. But he passed over the company to his only son, who was Howard Brennan Johnson. And unlike his father, who left school in the eighth grade to assist his father, whose company eventually went bankrupt, Howard Brennan Johnson was well-educated. He attended Moses Brown in Providence, Milton Academy, Phillips Andover, Yale, and the Harvard Business School. So he was well-equipped to run a company in the 1960s and 1970s. But in a lot of ways, he began off quite well. Beginning in 1961, he placed the company on the New York Stock Exchange. If you liked Howard Johnson's, maybe you would like to buy a share of stock or even a block. And it was said that between 1961 
and the founder's death in 1972 that the family sold $1 billion worth of stock. Howard Johnson, the son seen here, was doing quite well. He would also streamline the business and basically make the restaurants themselves a little more sleek, a little more modern. But they didn't look different, whether it was here in Woolburn or in Miami Beach or on the West Coast. These were called the NIMS design. He hired a man named Rudolf NIMS, who was an architect from Atlanta, Georgia, who created a prototype that would be built throughout the country. Center entrance, the dining room on the left, the counter with stools on the right, an orange roof, and a pared-down cupola. In this instance, it was not only cost-effective, but it was also something with a 100 or 150 parking spot uh, area would actually attract many, many people. But the son was also someone who, unfortunately, could not take competition, unlike his father. During the period of the 1960s, we saw the rise of fast food. Burger King, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken were all doing extremely well. But even combined, they could never compete against Howard Johnson. But there were some that could. And maybe you remember the Red Coach Grill? Well, the Red Coach Grill was a wonderful restaurant. They served fine seafoods and steaks. Their motif was a stagecoach with a red roof. Well, Howard Johnson, the son, bought them out. And he also bought out Mug and Muffin, which was a small chain. And during that period of time, by expending so much money, he caused a cash flow problem. And by 1966, he was beginning to see less of an investment in the restaurants. But he was also making poor choices. And one of the things was that he wanted to update the waitress's uniform. They always had worn aqua and white uniforms. But in 1966, rather than to source it locally, he approached the House of Dior in Paris <laughs> to actually create a new uniform. Now, the uniform would actually have four prototypes, and he actually asked the 12,000 waitresses throughout the country to vote on their favorite uniform. Well, here was Miss Massachusetts Howard Johnson on the left, and the women on the right were two Parisian models from the House of Dior. This cost $25,000 as a campaign. It's not a huge sum of money today, but in 1965 to 1966, it was more than the price of a house. Well, many people began to realize that the son was actually spending money recklessly. And in that period, he continued to expand the company started by his father on the motel chain. The founder had opened the first motel in 1954 in Savannah, Georgia. Many people coming from the north going to Florida for the winter wanted a clean, decent place to stay. And when he opened it at Savannah, it did very well. Well, these motels opened as if by magic throughout the country. And by 1970, there were over 750 motels attached to a restaurant that you could simply walk to. It was a great success. But we began to see people in the 1970s looking at Howard Johnson's, especially because they froze their food and would reheat it, as something that was a little less than what the founder had thought of. And seen here, the founder, by the period of the 1970s, was someone who had stepped down. But he was also someone who couldn't have imagined how successful his restaurant chain would have become. In a lot of ways, it was a place where people of all walks of life went to, even the great and mighty, as we saw here with, of course, Jacqueline Onassis. Howard Johnson's 28 flavors of ice cream were important. It wasn't just a premium ice cream. It was something for every palate. And because it was with natural ingredients, it wasn't just delicious. But in the Nicola Cone, it was something that was twice the size of what other places served. And when I wrote this book, A History of Howard Johnson's, How a Massachusetts Soda Fountain Became an American Icon, I tried to include not just early history, but to go the gamut of why it was sold. Eventually, in 1979, the company was sold to Imperial Group, which is a British conglomerate, primarily of pubs and places of resort in the British Isles. 
They bought it for $135 million, which was much lower than the valuation when the founders stepped down as president. But the company was eventually broken apart. Marriott, of the chain, would actually buy the motels, and we would see the individual restaurants split apart. Franchise associates arose for those that actually owned the franchise, but the company owned by the family was sold outright. Today, there are only two restaurants in the United States, one in Bangor, Maine, and one in Lake Placid, New York. And though they bear the name Howard Johnson, they have no bearing or concern to Wyndham Corporation, which is the successor to the name of Howard Johnson. In a way, it was something that was a phenomenon of the 20th century. And in a way, I think of it as something like a delicious memory from the past. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. I just wanted um, I just wanted you to talk about Baker Chocolate and some of the other books and what you do with your research. Tell me. Well, this book was uh, one of 68 books that I've written over the last 20 years. I don't do this basically for a living. I'm an accountant during the business day, and I teach at the Urban College of Boston uh, humanities courses. Local history is a fascinating aspect, but my last book that just came out was called Lost Boston. That was published by Inova Books in London. It's a grouping of essays that talk about things that have been lost. Maybe you might remember Braves Field or Jordan Marsh Department Store or the Opera House. And what I tried to do in a lot of ways is to talk about the things that some of us might remember or even have heard about. Well, local history is fascinating, and I collect quite a bit. This book is lavishly illustrated. I do have copies with me this evening. They're $20. But it has over 90 wonderful photographs, many of which I bought on eBay. I check eBay before I do anything, even the death notices. <laughs> and eBay is something that I not only collect these things, and I use them in the book, but then what I try to do is to put everything into a small collection, and they go to the University of Massachusetts archives. Then they're available five days a week, eight hours a day, for anyone who wants to research. I wrote a book on Howard Johnson, but maybe you would want to do interesting research on waitresses of the 20th century or restaurant architecture. And what I have is a huge collection that is then available for people to actually look at. Baker Chocolate was a book that I did about four years ago. I lived in Milton for many years, and I'd lectured on the history of Baker Chocolate for many years. Putting the book together, you began to realize it wasn't just the oldest manufacturer of chocolate in the United States. It started in 1765, but it's still going. It's part of Kraft Family Foods. So when you think about chocolate, you think about Howard Johnson, when you think about the other books that I've written, which are almost on every neighborhood of the city of Boston and some of the surrounding towns, you begin to realize that history can be fun. And as you see here with the Rubin Historical Society, it's something you want to be engaged in. And one has some interest, but a book might actually bring more. And in a lot of ways, when I do this in a slide lecture like this evening, I try in some ways to show people in visual format how fascinating local history can be. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was wonderful to have Anthony. It's wonderful to have you come out this evening. I do hope you uh, come and uh, to the Vintage Paper Reef exhibit and sale on Saturday at the Burdette Mansion. But you might have also noticed that um, you know that we're very active in our school programs, uh, Partners of Education. The school department um, has come and asked us to be um, part of a program in April with our third graders. And what we're going to do um, is have trolley tours of our scavenger hunt. If you saw the scavenger hunt uh, slide, I think, that they had up there, they really have to have, the third graders has to have as part of their curriculum by the state of Massachusetts, they have to know about their state and the city they, or town they come from. So we have, are working with them now, and we're going to take the kids, all schools, all nine schools, for five straight days. Uh, two schools each day, morning and afternoon, 
during the school day, and this is before school vacation in April, and we're going to take them to maybe 10 or 15 places in Woburn so they can learn local history. And that's really one of the reasons we're trying to raise as much money as we can is for the trolley. We do uh, beg, borrow, and steal, but we're going to do it, and um, we, we hope that uh, it's a successful program. They'd like us to do it every year, uh, so we're very thrilled to be part of that. And in that, you know, we do these programs such as the Vintage Paper Wreath. And also, if you notice, we're going to sell some wine for the holidays. Uh, Boston Winery um, has sold us uh, three types of wine. It's going to um, honor one uh, Tanner Red, which is a red wine. It's going to honor our tannery and leather history. The, um, I'm not a wine drinker, but the Chardonnay, the white wine, is going to honor our family farms. It's called Harvest. And then we have a sparkling wine, which is going to honor Holy Beach and um, Han Pond area. So they'll be sold at Colonial Package stores for the holidays. I hope you come in to, it's just through the holidays, through the first of the year, but I hope anything um, helps if you can buy a bottle of wine for summer. I'll keep it for yourself as a memento. I want to thank Anthony. I hope he can sell. His books are going to be up here for sale. Come and have some ice cream with us, and thank you very much. <laughs>